Welcome uh, and greetings to Maranatha Church family and anyone else who is tuning in to watch us today. We are thankful to be able to worship in this way. We continue to use the electronic mode as you're seeing, knowing that the Lord is with us each one wherever you are and he's with us here now and uh, we're bound together in Christ. Now Pastor Keith is on vacation. He is not sick. He is not in quarantine. Uh, he is just, this was a scheduled vacation spot and and so he, uh, we continued with that plan and so I'm thankful to have this opportunity to uh, proclaim God's Word this morning and uh, my name is Pastor Dave Bonney and we welcome you uh, to our uh, worship this morning. And we continue to encourage you, uh, know, know that the leaders and the church family is praying for one another, continue to remain in God's Word, or continue to pray as God brings people to mind, pray for them, or you can do it strategically using the uh, church directory and pray your way through that. And it, it's all different times for all of us in, in all our different contexts. And so we, but as a church, we continue together to glorify God and, and bring him honor and glory. But the other thing about these days is whether you're, getting, you're not getting out as much and your routine is uh, disrupted, so sometimes you're not sure. Yeah, is this Monday? Is this Tuesday? What day is this? We lose track of where we are in the week and where we are in the month. And so as I was thinking about what to uh, have us focus on this morning, I thought, let's uh, prepare our hearts uh, a bit for Easter. We're in the Easter season, and it's getting closer, and soon we'll be Palm Sunday and Good Friday, and, and so we want to prepare our hearts for Easter. So we're going to look at a text from the Gospel of Mark, and it's one that deals with preparing for Christ's death and resurrection. It's preparation. Now, because God is sovereign and he is at work, he's, he's been preparing us for these times. It's unusual times for us, but for him, uh, he's been preparing us. I look back in uh, our care group uh, studies that we've been doing in the care group that I, I lead, and I've been reminded again just how God works, it prepares us. We were looking, for instance, at Psalm 23, and just I'll just talk about the first half. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me by still waters. He restores my soul. These are all powerful words for us in, in these times. And he leads me by in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even through these times, we want to give him glory. It's all, all to him. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so as I look back, that was part of our study, of course, and I just thought, thank you, Lord. Those were words we needed to hear and be reminded of. And of course, uh, Ever since we moved to BC in July 2018, uh, I've also been reminded of also one of my favorite psalms or a favorite psalm, uh, the first half of Psalm 121, that I lift up my eyes to the hills. Uh, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. And I lived in Manitoba, so. We, we, we had a mountain, we called a mountain, but it really was just a hill. But here we see the mountains and it reminds us of God's presence and that who is ultimately in control, uh, it is him. So even going through these difficult times and these challenge, uncertain times, we know that God knows and God is, is, is with us and he's at work. So we're talking about preparation and these were scriptures that God keeps reminding me of and maybe he's 
put some scriptures in your study, your devotional time, and keep holding on to them. Let him speak to you and encourage you, uh, for he is at work. He's still on the throne. Well, amidst all we're going through, then, we want to prepare our hearts and focus toward Easter, and Easter se we're in the Easter season. And I'd like to read from Mark's Gospel, Mark 14, uh, about a woman who comes and does something that was unusual and unique uh, to that time and that situation, but it was preparation for Christ's ultimate death and burial and resurrection. And so let's read first then from Mark 14, and verse, beginning of verse 1. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and scribes were seeking how to arrest him by some stealth method or sly method, some translations say. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it all over his head. And no doubt it would have run down all, to, even to his feet. And there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why, this, why was the ointment wasted like this? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for, for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Let's just have a word of prayer before we uh, talk about this passage. Father God, we thank you that you are on the throne and that you have been working and preparing us and even though we didn't realize all that was going on. Lord, we do ask you would guide through this time, be with each one listening, bless their time, whether they're alone or with others. And Lord, take your word and make it clear and apply it to each one of our lives. For Lord, we do desire to hear from you and we do desire to honor you. So we pray these things and commit this time in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. In the Gospel of Mark, we are at a point where Jesus is very close to the cross. He has been, uh, throughout his ministry, doing what he called, he called disciples to prepare them so that they could carry on the ministry, even as we have that opportunity to serve the Lord today. And he's been training them and showing them his power and his teaching. He had done this to the point that they finally came to the realization back in Mark chapter 8 when Jesus asked them, but who do you say I am? He First he asked, what do other people say I, who I am? And then he says, but who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. They got the message that he was truly Messiah, evident in his life, his teaching, his power. And now, then the scripture says, and then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly to them. And so the, they had a sense of what was coming. They will we'll see as you walk through that last week and even after the uh, resurrection that they still needed to be f fully uh, 
come to the point of fully grasping what Jesus had done on the cross and by rising again. But here we come to this passage where uh, this woman comes to Jesus and the text says in the, in the context, they were in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper. And so she is, uh, he is there and they're reclining at the table. That's how they ate then. And, um, I've been in context on the mission field where we actually sat on the floor to eat. Um, but in those days, they had a low table and they were able to kind of recline and, and eat in, in that way. And he's at the house of Simon the leper. Now, isn't that interesting? Uh, in this context, he is called Simon the leper. It doesn't mean he had leprosy or they couldn't be there. It's just like today. There's quarantine and you cannot... It, it, you need to isolate if you're with someone and, uh, or if you encounter someone who has coronavirus you have to be careful and isolate but then it was the disease was leprosy and it was a very deadly disease in fact people who got it isolated themselves into whole colonies they could be together in a colony but they could not be in the general public for it was very contagious and, and, and dangerous. So we kind of understand that now with our situation now. And, and yet he's called Simon the leper because it, he is no longer uh, actively uh, dealing with the disease, but he has been healed. He is finished. And that's why when we watch those numbers, we not only watch those that have been infected with coronavirus and those being treated, but we, we also look and, and see those who have recovered and we are thankful that we have people on the front lines that are helping and, and working and people are looking for a cure and we pray for them all that someday this will pass again and things will, quote, be back more to normal. God is always at work. And so here, here they are at the house of Simon the leper. And uh, while it doesn't say in the text, it, we believe that Jesus no doubt healed him. And he, he had been healed from uh, this leprosy. And so as an expression of thanks and honoring to Jesus, he had put on this dinner uh, for him. And this woman comes in, and the first thing I want you to see is her love expressed, love expressed. She comes in, and it's an unusual way, but she comes in, and the text says, as she was reclining, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it on his head. And so that, that she expressed her love by giving this very expensive perfume. It was in an alabaster jar which had a long neck and uh, whether she broke it uh, on the floor or on the edge of the table, but she broke it all and she gave it all. She did not hold back. Uh, she gave it all to Jesus. It was at a great cost, and she gave it totally. And to me, that challenges us uh, with our own lives. Do we give our whole selves to Jesus? Do we give our whole self? Or do we just sort of give partially or 50-50? When I look at devotion like that, you're, you're challenged, and you marvel and say, I want to be like that. I want to give my all to Jesus. Say, Lord, be all... Lord of all my life, here I am. And we surrender ourselves to him. Uh, I, I reminded of a, uh, a missionary martyr, and you could point to maybe many of you read bi uh, missionary biographies or other biographies. Uh, 
by Jim Elliott, and he was a martyred missionary who, along with his friends, was killed January 8, 1956. And he, he said this, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. His friends had gone to share the gospel in a primitive setting and were killed. And, and, and yet, as history bore out and as God worked, his family was able to go back and even that tribe eventually came to know Jesus Christ and were one uh, for him. But what I want you to see is that it's about giving your all to Jesus, to make him Lord of your life in all ways. Remember Romans 12, 1, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. We need to give our all to Jesus. Now someone has jokingly said that the problem with living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. But that's not what we want to do. We want to give our all and follow him. Remember what Paul says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So is he Lord of your life in all ways? There was an evangelist teacher back in my college days, um, called, his name was Paul Little, and he said this, if Jesus isn't Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. That we need to let him be Lord of all our lives. This is love for Jesus. So in these times, are you loving Jesus? Is he Lord of all? How do we express our love to him? Well, we express it through obedience. 1 John 5, 3 says, This is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. It's also surrender, this surrendering of ourselves to him. Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Or Jesus also said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And so we are to love the Lord. And that's our surrender. And then as we prepare for Easter, as we live every day, that is so crucial that we surrender ourselves to him. And it will reflect itself in loving others. First uh, John four twenty one says this, and this commandment we have from him: whoever loves God must also love his brother and sister. And so I, I just challenge us each one. Maybe you want to take a moment right now uh, in your own heart. Do you love him? Is he Lord of your life, Lord? Hear our prayers. We surrender ourselves to you. So that's love expressed. Well, then we see love criticized. One wonders how anyone could be critical of what the woman did. I mean, it was unusual. It wasn't typical. She did barge into the meal. But uh, she had given it all to Jesus. And, and so... And yet what we see in the text is people criticize. Some of those present that in Mark's gospel says were indignant. Matthew says that it was the disciples, and John implies that it was specifically Judas, primarily him, but it was all the disciples were indignant with her. And then there their rebuke of her was, why this waste of perfume? She had given it to Jesus, but it could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Their motives become evident as you read through the text and, and look at it. 
but you, you wonder how that could happen. Perhaps they didn't understand what the woman was doing. They obviously had a different opinion of what she should be doing. Uh, they may have been disappointed with themselves that they didn't think of it. And maybe even jealous that she was getting all the attention from Jesus. And we know for sure that Judas was uh, greedy for the money and thought if he had got that first, he could have uh, sold it on the side. And Jesus warns us that when we follow him with our whole hearts, that, that there will be opposition, there will be even criticism. He says in John's Gospel, John 16, If the world hates you, know that it hated me first, before it hated you. And so, don't be surprised if you get criticized for following the Lord with your whole heart. And yet, that's what we want to do. We want to motivate others and be a good example and be motivated by good examples. And we need to affirm one another in our walk with Jesus, uh, to walk closely with him. So we have love expressed and love criticized, but then love defended. I mean, I don't know how you feel when someone criticizes you. Most of us are, it's, a, it's hard, we don't like it, but sometimes we would evaluate, well, is it justified or not? But most of the time it just hurts. And, and yet, so we don't know, this woman may have just lowered her head or uh, after she had done this act of sacrifice and giving to Jesus. But what we see in the text is Jesus steps in and says, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. He defends her. She did it to him and for him. And he saw it as a beautiful thing. Thing. Now, he goes on to say that you will always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not have always have me. It was a unique time. Jesus was there. She had done what she could. She had anointed my body beforehand for burial. She had pointed to the fact that he was going to go to the cross and die and be buried. We know that Jesus was concerned for the poor and for others that uh, were involved in his life and ministry. Uh, we know that he taught his disciples, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as hypocrites do. Um, to be honored by man, I tell you the truth, you have received, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And so Jesus has concern for his ongoing work and ministry. These times have been challenging churches too. We usually come and give our offerings and uh, to the Lord in a worship service, and now we're having to find different ways that we can give to the Lord, because we still want to give to Him and care for the poor, care for our church ministry through uh, uh, the tithes and the offerings. But this was a special event. She was doing not only the giving, but she was pointing to his coming death and ultimate resurrection. He said, love defended. Jesus is our defender, our advocate. I love uh, 1 John 2, 1, it says, My dear children, I write this so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. We have an advocate with the Father, some translations say. So when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you know, uh, Satan, our own minds try to uh, sometimes defeat us and, oh, you blew it again, or why'd you do that, or uh, seek to bring us down. But Jesus says, that's 
he is forgiven. She is forgiven. He is our advocate. And so here in this story, we see Jesus acting in that role, that he uh, defends the woman in her action, for she had done it truly unto him and for his glory. So we have love expressed, love criticized, then love defended, and then love remembered. Uh, he had, Jesus goes on to say, I tell you the truth, that wherever the gospel is preached throughout the whole world, what she has done will be told in her memory. What would be told? Well, what she did, the actual incident, her love for Jesus, her sacrifice, but her preparation of Jesus' body for his death and burial. That's again, we come back to that theme. He uh, came to die for us. The Son of Man came to give his life in atonement for others. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says, For I deliver to you what also I receive, that Jesus died in our for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures or in romans 5 it says for god demonstrates his love to us that while we were yet sinners christ died for us and so we need to always remember that and we pray that at this easter season that still that message will get out that we will still people will still hear so that they might turn their hearts to him now it, the remembrance in that immediate context of course would be the smell of that perfume people would walk by the simon the leper's house and go hmm, what's that's pretty strong what's what's that he said well that, that's the perfume from the woman who gave it all to jesus when he was here the other day and now, wherever the gospel goes, it's not a literal smell, but it's that smell of the gospel, the truth of what Christ has done. She pointed to his death. For in Romans 1, we have been studying, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for everyone who believes, for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Or in 1 Corinthians 1, 23, it says, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles but to all who are called it is the power of God unto salvation it was a beautiful thing because it spoke of what Jesus has, was going to do and dying on the cross there's another time that something's called beautiful and that's also in Romans Romans chapter 10 and it says this how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. And then verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This, these verses were very strong in, in my call to missionary service and ultimately, and ultimately to full-time service for Jesus. But we're all called as believers to live our lives, and it's a beautiful thing when you point people to Jesus, when you talk about him, when you invite them to hear uh, the good news of the gospel, or as Jesus himself said, let your light shine before men in such a way through acts of kindness. And this time in our history, we, there are different ways that even though we keep our social distance, that we can show kindness to others. We can call people. We can maybe help arrange uh, for them to get some groceries. Whatever means, we can show and let our light shine so that they may see Jesus, and that is a beautiful thing. 2 Corinthians 2.16 says, For we are the aroma of Christ. So the challenge today is to prepare. 
to be prepared. And even though we are restricted and, and can't get out and do as much as we normally would do, Easter reminds us of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This woman's example pointed to what Jesus was going to do, and that's what we need to do. But before we do that, we need to know that we know him. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Have you asked him to forgive your sins? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. So I also want to challenge you that if you're listening and do you know Jesus as your Savior? Have you come to that point where you've asked him to forgive your sins and be your Savior? That is why he came. Do it today. Today is the day of salvation. And you can do that right where you are and just say, Lord, uh, you know, I, I'm a sinner and I ask you for forgiveness thank you for what christ has done that he died and rose again for me and i receive you as my savior you could say that prayer even where you are and i receive him so thank you for listening and we want to uh, wrap up by saying to take time uh, this week and thank jesus for what he has done uh, on the cross, uh, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Uh, maybe ask him to show you one or two practical ways that you can uh, show your love, express love expressed, uh, maybe to some neighbors or to church family. Uh, it could be a lonely time, phone people or check on them in ways that you can in a safe way. And... Remember that he is and needs to be your Lord. Surrender your heart every day, often maybe in the day, and say, Lord, be Lord of all, all that I am. I need you and take control of my life. Easter is coming, and we serve a risen Savior. May God bless you, and he is with you. Amen. Father, we thank you for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you that you came to be our Savior, that at just the right time in history, you broke in and went to a cross and died for each one of us. And I pray that if some hearing this message today accepted you as Savior, that you would... Encourage them, help them find some fellowship, and we thank you for their faith in you. And for each one who knows you, Lord, may they be encouraged this day. Bring to mind a key verse. Bring to mind uh, someone that they could phone or call or pray for. And we thank you for our church. We continue to pray for Pastor Keith and our leadership, and we ask that you continue to guide us and lead us along. And so we give you the glory, for it's unto you we pray and that we serve. So we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.